So good morning, everyone. Uh, many of you know me, but we do have friends online. So let me introduce myself. I'm Dorcas Gordon, and I am going to moderate our time together this morning. So as we begin, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Reverend Dr. Harris Athanasiatis to do the land acknowledgement and to offer an opening prayer. We're so thrilled to be here this morning. Uh, as a congregation, we have been and continue to be on a journey uh, in our uh, relationship with indigenous peoples of the land. And so uh, the land acknowledgement is, a, is an ongoing uh, process. So the congregation of Armour Heights Church acknowledges that the land upon which our sacred space is situated was occupied by indigenous peoples for thousands of years before settlers arrived, and they moved freely through the land, caring for it as it cared for them. These peoples included the Huron Wendat, the Tum, Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. Treaty 13, also called the Toronto Purchase, was negotiated in 1805. Indigenous people were pressured into putting a price on the land and were prevented from moving freely within it now that settlers can purchase it. The dish with one spoon understanding of land ownership meant that land was like a dish with one spoon many were invited to partake from. But settlers brought with them a different, more exclusive understanding of private property. In time, it was also recognized that the price set for the land was terribly incommensurate to its true value. Further negotiations and settlements were made over the years. Most recently, in 2010, a final settlement was made between the government of Canada and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. We give thanks for this land and continue to ponder how we may honor it as those indigenous to the land may teach us to honor it, we give thanks for the gift that it is and commit ourselves to heal the injustices of our relationships with the land and its first peoples. Now let us pray. O oh God of infinite mercy and compassion, Abba God who knows us inside out who knows our pain, our hurt, our troubles, but also has created us with infinite possibilities to grow and to blossom with faith, hope, and love in what you can do in and through us. We are grateful, O oh God, for those with the courage to bear witness to the ways of peace, of healing and reconciliation, Empower them, O oh God, strengthen them, and we are grateful for their witness as it may empower us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A warm welcome to all who are in this room this morning. We are a small but mighty group, and we are reflective of a large group that are coming in online and that will come in online as the YouTube presentation will be available permanently as long as you allow it to be, so I hear. Uh, so there will be many, many people who will have access to this event today, and for that, we are thankful. I'd like to thank the minister of the session of this congregation for their welcome to us and for assisting with the technology that assures our time together runs smoothly and will be meaningful. There will be a time for questions after the presentations. For those online, please send your questions by email. There is an indication online as to where those should be sent, but let me just repeat it. <clears throat> the email address is questions, with a capital Q, at Armour Heights, capital A, capital H, dot org. And we'll repeat that later in case anyone didn't get it. 
But let me say right now, what a delight it is to have with us Leila Alshek and Robbie Damelin. I won't call you Danny. <laughs> Robbie Damelin, members of the Parent Circle Family Forum. My colleague, the Reverend Joan Masterton, will introduce Leila and uh, Robbie more fully in a few minutes. But let me just say how profoundly moved I am to have both of them with us today. So a very special welcome, Robbie and Leila. I want to take just a very few minutes to say a little bit about the Parent Circle, its origins, uh, Parent Circle Family Forum. A joint Israeli-Palestinian organization, it has over 600 families as members. Created in 1995 by Mr. Yitzhak Frankenthal and a few Israeli families, the first meeting between these families and bereaved Palestinians from Gaza took place in 1998. In 2000, Palestinians from the West Bank and East Jerusalem joined the Parents Circle. And as many of you know, all its members have lost an immediate family member in the ongoing occupation. The vision of PCFF is one of promoting dialogue, tolerance, reconciliation as essential components of peace. And I know you will hear that again and again in uh, Lila and Robbie's presentation. Their commitment is to work towards an end to violence and towards achieving an accepted political agreement. They are opposed to the occupation and believe that it is possible for the occupation and its violence to end. Particularly, they oppose using bereavement to further violence or revenge. As part of its commitment, PCFF engages in many events and activities in Israel, Palestine, and overseas which brings us to our event today. Leila and Robbie are here in Canada at the invitation of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. At its General Assembly on Tuesday, the PCFF, through Leila and Robbie, received the E.H. Johnson Award, an award established to continue Dr. Johnson's commitment to a global view of mission and to continually extend the horizons of that mission. Our hope today is that in hearing Leila and Robbie's stories, we will be further empowered in the work many of us are already doing, continuing to raise awareness among Canadians about the violence and inhumanity of occupation and to be a force, this is the hard one sometimes for Presbyterians and other church people, to be a force pushing our government to move from silence to action, to become so that we as Canadians become leaders in speaking out internationally for justice and for peace in Palestine, Israel. I'm going to ask Joan now, as convener of the E.H. Johnson Committee, to please introduce our guests. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's a delight to be here this morning. I am the convener of what we have renamed, actually, the Cutting Edge of Mission Committee. And I want you to think about that in terms of our speakers this morning cutting edge of mission. That edge cuts when it cuts you personally. And certainly that is the case here. And so we are delighted. The committee was hoping to bring uh, Robbie and Lila to General Assembly last year in 2022. But because the assembly once again was on Zoom because of COVID, 
We decided to defer it because we wanted their presence here in person to make a difference here in Canada. So it is a delight to welcome both Robbie Dunlin and Lila Sheikh uh, to uh, speak with us this morning. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, thank you for the multitude of questions that I know you've already addressed. Please, Lila, are you going to begin? Great. Thank you, Lila. And maybe I could just say that at General Assembly, time is very constrained, and the business committee controls the action. So I have invited Layla and Bobby to please tell their story, only if they go over two and a half hours. <laughs> stories and first of all I want to thank everyone who have uh, this like um, invitation for both of us and it's an honor really to be here and this is my first time in Canada and I love your country so much <laughs> and uh, I think our message is so powerful and during this time exactly not just in Palestine and in Israel it's so powerful because the whole world now had a, a bad time and you could say a dark time. And this message, it's not just about the conflict in Palestine and Israel, it's a global message to everyone, to every kind of conflict. So I will start to speak about my story. My name is Leila Sheikh. I'm 45 years old. I'm a mother for five children and I have one grandson. Uh, I was born and raised in Jordan. My family originally from Bethlehem, but they went to Jordan because my father was a teacher and he went to Jordan because he wanted to teach the children in the camps. And after that, the war was started, so uh, the Israeli government closed the border, so my parents lost their citizenship as Palestinian and they become Jordanian. So because of that, I born there. My childhood was very normal, but maybe the only thing that my father always speak about Palestine, about his relative, about the places. So I love Palestine from what I hear from my father. And it's become like a dream for me to go back and visit Palestine or even live. So after I finished my study in accounting and business in Jordan, I met my husband, he's originally from Bethlehem. So in 1999, I went to uh, Palestine to live there, to get married, and to start my life. And for me, that was one of the most amazing things happened in my life, like the dream come true. And you could imagine how much I become so happy to be there. I visited all the places, meet all the people that my father mentioned. And uh, our happiness to come much more after a year when we have our first daughter and to start to have our own family, that was something so great. But after two months, the second uprising started and that was one of the most horrible things that I faced because for me, that was the first time I lived in a very complicated situation like that. And I was really terrified, especially when the Israeli government decided not to give me my Palestinian ID. So that meant I can go freely from place to place. Most of the time I should stay at home and I can't visit my family in Jordan. But I said to myself, it's okay because I have my family to take care of and I will be busy with them. And uh, our happiness become much more after a second year when we have our second son. He was a boy, we named him Poseidon. And Poseidon means something far away. He was a very beautiful, intelligent boy, and we loved both of them. We started to have like um, plans for their future. But that happiness was ended 11th of April 2002, when he woke up at 4 o'clock in the morning in very critical condition, because at that night, the Israeli soldiers came to our village, and they had 14 gas, and because he was too young, his lungs couldn't hold that. So because we live in a village outside Bethlehem, we tried to take him to a hospital inside Bethlehem, but 
and Israeli checkpoints stopped us and they prevented us. And they said, it's a military zone, you can't enter. So the next chance was to take me to Hebrew, the next city to Bethlehem, but again, they told us that the main road is closed. So the last chance was to take him to Hebron, but we should take a rough and long road between the villages. And for the third time, an Israeli checkpoint stopped us. They searched the car, they searched the ID of my husband and my father-in-law. And then my father-in-law is, is the only one who speaks Hebrew. He went to them, tried to convince them to let us go, but they didn't listen. And during that time, you could imagine my son between my arms dying, and I didn't know what to do. So I started to think I should have a risk, and that risk will be, if they know that I didn't have a Palestinian ID, they maybe will take me to jail or send me back to Jordan, and I will never see my children again. But the only thing that I was scared about at that moment, how could I save my son? So I went to them, started to convince them, but even they didn't listen, and they stopped us more than four hours. And you could imagine that every minute was so important to save his life. So when we reached the hospital, the doctor said it's too late to save his life. And if he will stay alive for like 48 hours, he will be handicapped. So the two choices for me was unacceptable, even to think about it. A few minutes later, his condition became much worse, so they take him to the ICU. And even the doctors didn't allow us to enter that room because his condition was so bad. Two o'clock in the evening, the doctor came and he said, you should leave the hospital. And I said, why? He said, the Israeli soldiers who came and asked everyone who is not sick to leave the hospital because they said that the Palestinian fighters sometimes hide inside the hospital. I said to him that our son inside the intensive unit care. And he said, because of that, when you can't be with them, with him, they will ask you to move. So we argued a little bit with him, but finally we left. And that was much harder for me. How could I leave my son in that critical time alone? So immediately when we reached the house of my parents in law because at the time they were the only one who had phone, I called the doctor to, to see what's happened to him. And he started to talk and I didn't understand a word. It's not that I do not understand, but my mind wasn't except to listen to what he's talking about. So my husband came and he asked me what's going on. I said, I don't know, I don't understand what he's talking about. Please talk to him, but let the speaker on, I want to hear him. So he will be the same words, and then I start to shout at him and ask him, what's going on? And then he said, I'm so sorry, our son died. At that moment, I felt his word was like a bullet comes to my heart, smash it down for many pieces. I start to scream like a crazy cry, I didn't know what to do, especially my family wasn't even there to be beside me. So five minutes later, the house was full of people, relatives, neighbors, friends. But for me, I wasn't care about any one of them. The only thing that I was care about and thinking about is my son. So I start to convince myself that when we return back home, I slip in the car and this is just a dream and tomorrow morning I will bring my son back and everything will be okay. But unfortunately that was the truth. In the middle of that night I was really so tired. So I slept maybe for five minutes and I saw a white dog stand on my shoulder and say to me, Mama, don't cry, I'm so happy. But I couldn't stop crying from that moment until today every time. I think about him or even speak about him or even so the children in his age and how they become now and start to imagine how he could look like or what he can do now. That was the longest night I've ever had in my whole life. So the next day in the morning they bring him back to say goodbye for him until the moment that they put him between my arms. I was still thinking they lie for some reason and my son is still alive. So I missed him so much because that was the first time we were separated. So I take his blanket off and I was shocked when I saw him. He was very blue. And even until that moment, my brain was refused to believe what's going on. So I tried to kiss him in his cheek as I always do. But that kiss was totally different. I felt a kiss of frozen rock. So immediately, because I believe in miracles, I thought if I 
um, hug him so far, warm him enough, he will go back to life again. Well, the only thing that happened that they take him away from me. And that was the last moment that I hugged him. From that moment, I was filled with hatred, anger against maybe everyone, but the most against the Israelis, because for me, all of them were responsible about his death, because I always thought, why that happened? Like, when the Israeli killed the Palestinian or arrested him, they always said, he's a sniper, he's a terrorist, he's, he, or he throws stones against us, but my son, just six months old, what's the crime that he did? So I answered myself, and he said, it's only crime that he's a Palestinian. After that, my husband started to convince me to have other children, and I refused for more than three years. And one day, my doctor called me and he said, why you didn't want to have children? I said to him, why I will have them? If finally I will lose them because they will be part of this cycle of violence, even if I don't want to. But after that, I have another boy, and I give him the same name, because I didn't want to forget what happened every time I looked at his face or even called his name. So the time passed, and when you go through like something like that, you have two choices, to continue or even to commit suicide, or the chances is not many. But during that time, I didn't think to take revenge, because revenge for me will never bring my son back. But at the same time, I take a decision that I didn't want to have any relationship with any Israelis. So after 16 years, I met one of my friends that I didn't saw for a long time, and he started to talk about life, about children, and then he said that he um, participated in one of the projects for the Burn Circle, and he started to, like um, talking about that project, and I stopped him, and I said, are you crazy? I am the last person that you could talk to him about this. You know what happened to me? And he said, I'm going to ask you a question. Why until now you didn't tell your other children about what happened to their brother? I said, because I didn't want them to be part of this cycle of violence, because maybe if they know, they will start to, to take revenge, and I lost one of them, and that was much more than enough. I'm not ready to lose another one. So he said to me, so maybe this will be a good chance for you, not just to protect your children, maybe other families. But to be honest, I thought that he's crazy, and uh, he just imagined that. So uh, after like every three days, four days, he called me, and he started to talk about the parent circle, but I wasn't really convinced about what he said. So one day, he invited me to a conference in Bethlehem for the parents' circle. And I said, yeah, okay, I will go with you, just to make him stop talking about this. <laughs> so on that day in the morning, I started to think, what kind of excuse that I should tell him because I don't want to go there. Then he called me and he said, look, I know that you tried to find excuse and you didn't want to go there. Get dressed, I'm waiting on the car. I said, oh my God, he'll never leave me alone. So I should go with him just to make him stop talking about this. So when we arrived, it was like a big room like this. And there were just Palestinian. I sat with them and we started to talk. Five minutes later, the Israelis started to enter that room. I felt there was something aching in my chest. I can't breathe. I didn't want to be with them. I didn't want to see them. I tried to leave them. He started to convince me to say it. Since we had that argument, I saw something amazing me when I saw the Israeli and the Palestinians start to hug each other and kiss each other like family members, they talk, they laugh. And I said to myself, oh my God, they are so crazy. How they could do that? So I said to him, okay, I want to sit because I want to listen to them. I want to know what's the thing that makes them so close to each other like that. Some of the Palestinians start to talk about their personal story. It's something normal for me, like I heard this stories. But when the Israelis start to talk about their personal stories, I was really amazed and touched because for me, that was the first time I looked at them as a human like me. The first time I felt that we shared the same pain, we shared the same tears, even if we had a different circumstances, but we're still human. And nothing worse than losing a child. And no one could understand that pain unless someone be in the same situation. So I decided to participate in one of the projects called Better Narrative Project. 
and this is one of the most amazing project in the organization would give a chance for people from both sides to sit to talk about everything because we said this will never end until we talk so we will gather like for eight times we have 15 person from each side there's something between them like mothers doctors lawyers students so, uh, and we have two professors who spoke about the history of the two nations. We went, we went to visit the Vashem Museum to know much more about the Holocaust. We went even to uh, visit a uh, Palestinian village was existed before 1948. It's not about comparing the pain. It's not about to tell who's the best, who's the worst, who's first, who's next. But it's kind of understanding each other life and community and what's going on. So I remember the first activity they asked us to spoke about something happened during the conflict affect our life. And that was the first time I spoke about what happened to my son. Even between me and my husband, since his death, we didn't spoke about anything. And that was kind of open the one again, bring the memories back, the pain, the anger. I start to cry, couldn't complete the story. And there was an Israeli woman came and she started to apologize. And she said, yeah, I didn't hurt you, but the people who hurt you from my own people. And I'm a mother too, I could understand your pain. I could understand even the word that you couldn't say. And she came and hugged me and both of us started to cry. And she didn't know by her simple words how much she changed my whole life. Her word was like a light for me, opened my heart and my mind again to rethink about my life. As a Muslim mother, I believe in Quran, I believe in scripture, and that scripture said, you can't judge all people because of the mistake of one person. I know that, I believe in it, but I didn't work with it because I felt with hatred and anger. And then I remember that dream about white dove. I know that my son is having God because he's angel, but I didn't understand at that time why he came as a white dog. Then I realized that was kind of a message from God that this is your new mission. That he wanted to tell me that he didn't want the death of my son went without achieving something. So after that, I become a member of the forum, started with lectures at Israel, Palestine, travel around the world to spread the message of peace and reconciliation. And I thought I made everything right and my life become good and everything become amazing. But four months ago in Jerusalem, life gave me a new test. We've been in a meeting with other organizations and after we spoke about our story, a man stand up and he started to talk about his story. I know that man before, like he's uh, work in another organization, but I didn't hear his story before. So he started to mention that he was a high officer and he served in my area, and he prevented an Israeli, uh, Palestinian car which had six children from going to the hospital. And then it's become a real guest. I felt like there was a storm in my head, like someone slapping me in my face, because in my whole life, I didn't think that I would meet one of those people. So to be in front of me in that room, that was so hard. I couldn't breathe, I couldn't cry in the beginning. Then I started to cry and Robbie asked both of us to go outside to spoke about this. So he started to say it and he said to me, this is so important for me to tell you. And he started to mention that after time, his son becomes sick. And when he tried to take him to a hospital, the guard stopped him because, because he wanted to ask him a few questions. And he said, then just I realized what I did to the Palestinian. And he quit from the army, he established a new organization with ex-Palestinian uh, fighters, and they start to uh, work in the ground to make change. And then I looked at him and I said, look, this is so hard for me to listen to you. But at the same time, I want to thank you. Because if I know that part in your story was exist and you did it, tell me, I will never forgive you. But because you have that courage and you have that honesty to speak in front of me and to talk about that, I will forgive him. And he now become one of my best friends and he's an amazing man. And now I have many
many friends from the Israeli side, most of them become much more closer to me than my family members. And one of them is Robbie. She's for me not just a partner or a colleague, or she's like a sister for me. I learn a lot from her. I travel with her all the time, and we spend amazing time together <laughs> and laugh together so much. And uh, this is maybe our way to go out from stress and the exhaust. Thank you so much for listening. beginning of a dialogue. It opens people's hearts. So yes, we laugh a lot. Otherwise you get burnt up anyway. I'm always amazed at the strange places I find myself all over the world. I really, I, I couldn't tell you where I've been. This is like my fourth visit to Canada. And I've been to America so many times, I'm an honorary air hostess. <laughs> and it just insane. Um, Sri Lanka, India, all of Europe. And you learn from everybody and you meet the most extraordinary people. There are extraordinary people in this world who, despite what happened to them, have managed to find a way to have compassion, actually. And you spoke about the word tolerance. I don't like that word. Think about it when you say you tolerate somebody. We just had that little discussion. Corinne Armstrong, I don't know if you know who she is, she's a nun who wrote the most extraordinary books. But I learned that from her. Because when you tolerate someone, who am I to tolerate you? You know, we use all of these words in the jargon of uh, NGO jargon. And we have to be careful what we say. And also the nuances of, of culture. I mean, I stood in Congress and I said at one stage, um, the parent circle needs a sugar daddy. And it was in Congress in a briefing, and there was a sort of shock sound. And then everybody started to laugh. But it's important to understand nuances of culture, nuances of you can't sit in a Palestinian home if they can see the sole of your shoes. Funny things like that, which you learn over time. You can't say shush, because shush is for animals. And I, you know, one has to be aware because you can make the most terrible mistakes. You can't use the word in America when I said, uh, I'm mad. I meant I'm crazy, but they think it's angry. Mm -hmm. So, they're all of these things. And I think that we wouldn't be sitting in this room if there wasn't an element of social justice in all of you. Otherwise, you could stay at home and not get affected by the fires and not care very much about what happens in the rest of the world. Um, so I, I always ask, in a small room, what was your first act of social justice when you were a child? So I'm going to ask two people so we can hear that. Um, let's see. I think you, in the brown uh, rust chair. Uh, Do you want to come and use the microphone? Okay. Is there anybody who has something 
Would you like for to say? No. So I'll tell you my first act of social justice. It was in South Africa where I was born. And um, the man who delivered the milk used to come on a horse and cart. And he used to beat the horse. And I'm a crazy animal lover. So I decided I was five to steal the horse. <laughs> so, Barbara Fudge, my friend, and myself went off to the dairy with some carrots and we stole the horse. And we brought it back to my house and we put it in the tennis court. And then my father came home and found the horse in the tennis court, so he was not thrilled. And very shortly after that, I got sent to boarding school because he didn't realize that it was an act of social justice. It was. Um, so your life prepares you in many ways, boarding school, the convent, all of your life to become a victor and not a victim. And not to be a survivor. The word survivor has a strange connotation. I'd much rather be a victor. All my life I spent fighting for causes um, of the anti-apartheid movement and I thought that was very special. And of course, it was mainly to annoy my parents. So then when the Six Day War broke out, I came to live in Israel as a volunteer to save Israel in the Six Day War and found myself in a kibbutz working in a chicken house after I burnt various shirts because most South Africans had grown up with five servants. <coughs> I'm losing my voice and many people are very delighted. <laughs> so, um, I, I had no intention of staying in Israel. I wanted to leave South Africa and they wanted me to leave as well. <laughs> and, um, but I got married and I had two boys, David and Aaron. And uh, I got divorced and went to live in Tel Aviv. We lived on a moshav, which is like a kind of a kibbutz. And my children grew up in a very liberal, open home. Um, I couldn't believe when Iran had to go to the army. And I remember standing at the bus stop with David, and the tears were pouring down my face, and I couldn't believe that my child was going to carry a gun. You know? Um, you have to understand what it is to grow up in Israel and to be part of this whole system where from when you're very young, this is your duty. And Iran went off to war and there was one year and a month's difference between the two of them. So the next year David had to go and the same story happened to me again. And I remember they came home one, one weekend and we were having lunch and Problem? Don't hand out tissues. <laughs> I've got amazing things over there, but it's okay. And um, they were both in the army, and they came home. And we had lunch, and there was quite a lot of wine. And suddenly, both of them started to cry. It was the second uprising, and they started to tell me what they had to do. And they were horrified. And then the army was over, and then one went to India, which happens all the time in Israel. When, when the kids finish the army, they run away. And one went to South America to forget. You know, you don't forget, though. It's a trauma that stays for the rest of your life. And then they both came back and went to university, and David was studying for his master's in philosophy of education. And he was part of this the student uprising, can't imagine where he got that from. <laughs> and, uh, he was part of the peace movement and he was teaching students philosophy and then he got called up to go to reserves. Every year you have to go to reserves. And then, uh, but it was to be in the occupied territories and he didn't want to serve in the occupied territories. And he came to talk to me. And he said, I don't know what to do. If I don't go, what will happen to my students? They're going to be inducted into the army next year. Is that the right thing to do? 
I thought, yes. And then he said, and if I don't go, what happens to my soldiers? Um, he was the officer. And if I do go, I will treat people with dignity and so will all my soldiers. So please, you don't know always who the person is behind the gun. And he has a kid who's in such a dilemma, but goes nevertheless to God, settlers, where he doesn't agree for one minute that they should be there. And he was killed by a Palestinian sniper, along with nine other people. And um, only three years after he was killed, I was talking at the American Embassy in Tel Aviv, and there was a Palestinian sitting in the audience, and he kept looking at me. And in the end, I said, what? He said, I just, I just want to tell you that the day before your son was killed, I drove through that checkpoint, Palestinian man, and he came to the car. He David was very tall, one meter ninety-three. And um, so I remembered him and he asked me if he could see my papers and he said he would do it very quickly. And they got into a conversation. And he said, the next day when I heard your son was killed, I was so sorry. Here's the message of the parent circle. Because once you can recognize the humanity in the other, that's the beginning of the end of conflict. And I think that's the essence of much of what we do. When the army came to tell me, one of the first things that I said is, you can't kill anybody in the name of my child. I had no idea that I said that, but I was told afterwards. And I immediately started to look for something where I could prevent other mothers from experiencing this pain. Because I don't think there's a pain like this. I mean, I'm a fixer, but I can't fix this pain. But what I can do is to utilize it to make change. And um, I was looking for a framework to work in, and I was speaking at some huge demonstration to get out of the occupied territories, because I believe that the occupation is killing the moral fiber of Israel. And I, want, I love Israel, please don't make any mistake, but I want to live in a country that is moral. I want my neighbor to have freedom of movement, which is a basic human right. I want them to have their own country. So a religious Jewish man came to see me called Yitzhak Frankenthal. And he was even a bigger bulldozer than me, and that's really hard to find. <laughs> and he invited me to a weekend in East Jerusalem to meet other bereaved parents. I wasn't very keen in the beginning because I thought, well, I want to be with other bereaved parents, I've got enough. But I didn't realize how important that is, because they're the only people that can really understand. You know, uh, we think we understand what it is to lose a child, but actually we don't. And so he met me until I went to something like Ryder's story. And there were, I remember sitting around the table and looking into the eyes of the Palestinian mothers and realizing how we shared the same pain and that the tears that fell into a grave would be the same color and that we could be such a powerful force and we could be such an, uh, an example to the rest of the world because if we, she and I can stand here and talk to you, then surely you could become part of the solution and not the problem. You could also not take sides because what happens is when you take sides, you become pro-Israel or pro-Palestine you import our conflict into your country and create hatred between Muslims and Jews. For me, that's what's happening all over the campuses in Toronto. I was invited to go and talk to students in Toronto at the university between the Muslim and the Jewish students. They don't even know, I promise you, if you ask them on a map, where is Israel? I'm not sure they could find it. But it's easy to import, it's easy to be part of a cause, you know, and not look at the bigger picture. Because makes you feel good about yourself. In any event, I started to travel all over the world with the Palestinian partner, thinking that I was majorly important. And because I could speak English, albeit with my South African accent, the Americans thought I was British, which I thought was hilarious, because the British think I've got the most dreadful accents. <laughs> anyway, um, 
it was an opportunity to talk in the House of Lords, in the House of Commons, in Senate and Congress. And where is it? In Ottawa? Is that where your parliament is? I spoke there. And um, wherever anybody would invite me to a hip hop concert in San Francisco, I mean, everywhere and anywhere. I once went on a journey, like two hours, to talk to a group, and there was a whole bunch of 12 women knitting, like the Bastille. You know? <laughs> this is too much, you know. So I became a little bit more, um, what's the word, selective about where I would go and learned a little bit to say no, which is difficult for me, because you never know as hard you can touch. Anyway, one night I came home and I was sitting at my computer and there was another knock on my door. And I opened the door and there were three soldiers standing there. And when there are three soldiers, it only means one thing. So I just slammed the door in their face. And they kept knocking and knocking and knocking. And I thought, I can't lose another child. I can't. I can, you know, this I, vaguely can learn to live next to me, but I can't lose another child. It's like somebody comes and rips something out of your heart, and that hole doesn't heal. You learn to live with it next to you. And so, eventually I opened the door and they said, we came to tell you that we called the man who came David. And that is where, we were in a church, right? So I can't say whether the shit hit the fan, because that's where we did. <laughs> It was an impossibility for me, because where's the integrity and in the work I'm doing if I'm not willing to walk the talk? I didn't sleep for three months. I was walking up and down in my house, and I thought, I can't work in the parents' circle anymore. And eventually, one morning, I woke up, and I wrote within 10 minutes a letter to the family of the sniper who killed David. His name is Thaya. And two Palestinians from our group took the letter. In the letter, I told them about the parents' circle and that we have 600 families who've all lost an immediate family member. And actually the long-term vision is to create a framework for a reconciliation process to be an integral part of any political future peace agreement. Without that, we'll have another ceasefire until the next time. And so um, I also told them that I thought we should meet. We owed that to our children and grandchildren. Of course, you can imagine how shocked they were. They didn't expect to get a letter. And I am not the most patient character in the police. Imagine that I will hear from the sniper within days. It took three years. Um, he wrote me a, a letter over a website called Ma'am, in which he said that I'm crazy and that I should stay away from his family because he killed 10 men, 10 people, to free Palestine. But I knew that he killed 10 people because his parents had told us when he was a small child. And by the way, this is part of restorative justice, is understanding why. When he was a small child, he saw his uncle violently killed by the Israeli army in front of him. And in the second uprising, he lost two further uncles. And so he went, in my opinion, on a, on a path of revenge. He didn't realize there's no revenge. I promise you, I will do anything to spend one minute with David. And it's his birthday today. And yesterday on the plane, I was thinking of all the things that we'd done together. I used to go and watch dogs in the animal welfare to make them look beautiful <laughs> so people would adopt them. And, you know, all of these things stay with you. Um, so, uh, when I got that letter, uh, it was a sense of freedom. There was the release from victimhood. There was the time to, um, to be free, to continue with the work, because I did my piece in the meantime. That didn't mean I didn't want to meet with Thaya, I do. And um, I went to South Africa and we made a film called One Day After Peace. It was here at Hot Dogs in Toronto. We had the premiere there. And it, it's been all over the world and opened a lot of doors for me. And if you pay me a large amount of money, I might consider giving you a drink. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
then I, I think that what happened was I, I met an extraordinary woman in South Africa called Jennifer Lee. She was white and Afrikaans. And so, of course, you could immediately give her a label, she's pro apartheid. But she wasn't. She went to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and she said to the people who killed her daughter, I forgive you. And I wanted to know what she meant. Because I think, what is the definition of forgiving? Okay, here it comes again. What's your definition of forgiving? Wait, well, they can't hear. Uh, about releasing maybe and let them go at the very core level, um, something that's, that's rigid. And uh, do you give up your right to justice? The question is what justice is. And what I feel is one thing, what is justice, maybe it's another. Well, that's a very smart answer, but I mean, you know, it's like, do you give up your right to justice? Is it okay what the person did? Can they do it again? Do you forget? How can I ever forget? So what is it, you know? And, and I ask this very often wherever I go. And so, um, I went to visit this woman who said to the people who came to her daughter, I forgive you. And I said, what's your definition of forgiving? And she said, for me, forgiving is giving up your just right to revenge. Mm -hmm. And then I met the man who actually sent the people who killed her daughter. It wasn't intentional to kill her daughter, but she just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And he said, by her forgiving me, she released me from the prison of my inhumanity. And I thought that was the most extraordinary thing you could say. They together have a, an organization where they work with ex-combatants. And so I came back to Israel and I thought, I told you I can talk to you tomorrow morning, I'm warning you. It's all right, stop it. <laughs> and um, so they have this, I came back to Israel and I thought, no, it's time for me to meet Zaya. And I'm not going to go into the whole story, but the fact is that I can't get into the jail. And the bottom line is that he has to ask to see me. And so I called his lawyer because I don't give up all that easily. And his lawyer promised that he would write to me. But there's a certain quality in the Palestinians. When they don't want to say no, they don't want to say no, so they don't answer the telephone. <laughs> Do you know that story? So we don't know, and it doesn't really matter all that much anymore. It was very important for me to do this closure. It wasn't about him saying, I'm sorry. I wasn't looking for that, you know, but I was looking to close this. And I'm very interested in restorative justice. We've been to a lot of conferences on restorative justice, and I could tell you a lot of stories about that, but that's for another time. And so, Lila and I are two people, but we just represent a whole bunch of other people whose stories are just as compelling and just as interesting and watching transformation from hatred and violence and, and wanting revenge into this understanding that you don't want any more bloodshed. And to protect your children, we're going to have to find a way to end this conflict. Without that, I don't know what will happen. And Lila told you about some of the work we're doing. These are very dark times in Israel. We have a fascist government, which is like, almost like many places in the world now where this has become a playground for fascists. Sweden, who would have imagined? Italy, Hungary, who knows where that is going? So, we can't give up. Um, I don't know if you know the name Itamar ben Gvir, but he's the Minister of Police, who should really be in jail himself. And um, he's trying to prevent us from going into the schools. One of the very big parts of the work that we do is almost like Lila and I came here this morning, Palestinian and an Israeli goes into an Israeli school, talks to 17-year-olds, especially because that's just before they go to the army. <coughs> I'm sorry, what can I do? And, um, <laughs> would you like an awesome 
No, no, each of them gave me with this cough. It's not COVID, I promise you. Yeah. <laughs> it's the smoke. Is it wild heart? Maybe. Yeah, yeah no, I've been coughing like this for months. Oh, no, okay. So, um, they come and demonstrate outside the schools, and we're just waiting to see if we're going to be accepted by the Ministry of, of uh, Education to continue going into schools. But it's very precarious, and I think they could well say no, in which case then the headmasters can invite, can, um, invite us to come and talk. And we will go to the High Court, just as we did a couple of months, months ago, when we have an alternate ceremony um, on Memorial Day, you can watch it on YouTube, where we have a joint ceremony together with Palestinians. It's actually Memorial Day for fallen soldiers in Israel. But we chose to do, uh, together with Combatants for Peace, a memorial ceremony together. And because of the situation now in Israel, and all the demonstrations, democratic demonstrations, we are part of this trying to stop democracy. You know, that we are part of the people who are being attacked. And, and this is an anti-democratic situation. The Minister of uh, Defense decided not to allow the Palestinians to come. So we went to the Supreme Court and we won. And I can't tell you what a sense of joy that is. And so we had the ceremony and 15,000 people came and nearly 300,000 people listened and watched over online. So there is this international, I mean, it was from all over the world, there's an international quality of the message that we give, it's not only local. We do, we have a very powerful women's group, and if you ask questions, maybe I will tell you about a certain project we're doing. And, um, but the schools is very important for us, very important. And the women's group do a lot of work in homes in Palestine, so I would go into an average uh, Palestinian home together with Lila or one of the other members, um, and there would be quite an antagonistic attitude in the beginning. But once you tell your personal story, there's an emotional breakthrough that happens with the personal story. And then they come to other events that we have, and, and why would they not think like that? Because everybody that they've ever met in their lives or either soldiers or settlers. So why would they think I'm any different? And that's part of the work, and I'm now going to be quiet for once and allow you to ask questions. Thank you. Right. 
But you get a lot of money from USA, maybe not a lot. Yes. yes. But um, I think it should be made clear that the pressure from governments, mm -hmm. somebody asked for more pressure from your government, but I never said that. I did that. You did? Yeah. So um, that was where that pressure was. <laughs> Ah, so um, the 65% was, they planned that to try to close down all the organizations, NGOs, because 65%, if you get it from USAID, there's no way you can continue with the work. But there was pressure from America, from the European Union, I don't know about Canada, but from many countries, and uh, they gave up on that one. Also, the demonstrations are extraordinary. Every week now, for the 22nd week, hundreds and thousands of people come out onto the streets, and they're not all left-wing people. They are religious, they are right-wings who don't agree. You know, the judicial system, in many ways, is the last vestige of democracy. If you remove that, I don't know what will be. Questions, Barb? I was just thinking about what we have learned about what's happening right now in terms of the political control of the judiciary, and yet what you were saying about the uh, the decision by the Supreme Court, is it the Supreme Court? I don't know whether that's what you call it, but anyway. Um, how do you see those folk are, and what kind of pushback are they making in terms of the judiciary legal folk uh, in that system against the political attempt to control them? Well, that's one That's literally what all the demonstrations are about. Yes, yes. So um, even ex-prime ministers, ex-army um, officials, all people who have influence have come to these demonstrations as well. So one would hope, in the meantime, it's kind of Netanyahu who wants it ready because then he might not have to go to jail, um, has the pressure is on. And so it's kind of fading, but it can rise, raise its heavy head. And if you look at the budget that was just passed, it's horrific. One can only hope that the government will fall soon. The parent circle is not affiliated to any political party. But we are all political people. Anybody that's in a peace movement is political. Thank you. Questions? Any from our online folk yet? No. Not yet? So, uh, Harris. Sometimes I, I know I've, I've heard this and, and other people, you know, especially those who are very sympathetic to the cause of, uh, you know, Palestinians, talk about how incommensurate it is in terms of the loss and so on, at least what we get in the news and so on. You have spoken of a loss is a loss is a loss and you don't compare it. Um, but how does, the, does that sometimes become a barrier or a challenge in terms of your organization and the people that, you know, Palestinians and, and Israelis as an organization or, or in terms of people participating? Uh, in, our, in our community or even the Israelis, we have the same reaction that we have both sides who like uh, encourage us, supported us, but those are people who are against that. Like, first of all, my oldest daughter, she was against that and because she knows the whole story. And she said, how could you do that? And how could you be with them? And after what happened to my brother? So in the beginning, that was so hard for me. Even how should I explain to my children? So uh, told, Robbie told you about the Memorial Day that we have every year. So I was one of the speakers for two years. So when I go back home, I was really terrified because I didn't know what their reaction would be. So um, my oldest daughter came and she said, just now I understand why you are doing this and I'm so proud of you. And that was the most important point in this whole uh, journey.
journey because if my children could understand that, it would be easier for me to speak about that and to convince other people. And there's other people who are convinced, but they don't want to show that because they are afraid of something. Yes. Yeah. And one of the people, even my father was against that because my father was one of the fighters inside um, Fatah organization, you know, Fatah was the first organization against the occupation. But he, um, like, quit and become a teacher. So when he knows that I become part of the organization, he become angry and he asked me to quit and he started to say, you shouldn't be with them, they're still our enemy. Then I said to him, I'm going to ask you two questions. You know that my son died, did you know the story? And he said, no, you didn't tell us anything. I said to him, you know that I stayed in Lebanon for 11 years and then came to visit you because I didn't have a Palestinian ID. Did you know what happened to my life? And he said, no. I said to him, how could you judge me? How could you ask me what to do or not to do? This is my life. And I'm the only one who are responsible about these choices. And then he was shocked because that was the first time I argued with him about something like that. And for my father, that was like a red line. I didn't cross that line. I jumped from that line. <laughs> <laughs> and I was really shocked to have that courage and power to argue with my father. That was something amazing. But when you believe in something, whatever happened, you could fight for your thoughts and to prove how much this is important. Because nothing worse, as we said, than losing a child. And we take this power from the pain. Like we said, the thing that didn't break you down make you stronger. And we get this strength from this pain. So no one could, like nowadays we have threatened from other people like because of what we are doing but there's a lot of people who are against that and so especially for three or four days uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon have a TV show and they spoke about against us and imagine how much people they were afraid about that but we say no we should continue and if those people start to talk about this that meant that our message is so powerful, and because of that, there are people who are against it. Thank you. Did you want to add anything, Ravi, to that? Yeah. Uh, other questions? Yes. What percentage of the parent circle are moms? All? Mothers are mothers. Um, is it primarily women? No? We are families. Uh, that's that's the the <laughs> <laughs> uh, most of us are families, not individuals. Like mothers, fathers, children. So all the family involved. So we didn't have like... And they are equal, the Palestinian and the Israel equally equal. So. Thank you. Did you have a question, Michael? It's not an online question, but it's one that I will ask. Um, you were referencing, Rami, you were referencing, well, uh, Leila, you have a, a project that you could talk about. Could you share a bit with us about that? You got paid beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> so one Saturday morning, we have a meeting in the office for the women. And then Robbie came and she started to ask women what kind of thing that you would like to do. So every woman started to describe, some of them uh, want to make cakes, some of them want to be a um, makeup artist, some of them want to um, like uh, design dresses. So she said, so what about to have a project for like, uh, wedding planners and we said wow this is amazing like every one of us start to do the thing that she like work together this will be amazing so every woman start to study and she had a course for what she would like to do and it's not just about money and to have a project. It's about the passion, about doing something you really like and
because most of the mothers, they have time, but they didn't know what to do. And it's even a chance to let their children be part of this project and let them be away from the street and away from this uh, circle of violence. And some of them, they start really their own project and they start to train their neighbors. And this is something amazing. And for like two months or three months, uh, they graduated and they have their own certificate and they start to have their own project. And for me, I still didn't finish my course, but I even went to the uh, university because I want to continue that for another four years. And maybe one day I will have my own. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one of the most amazing projects that you could help mothers. Because if they most of the time stay just at home and thinking about, about their bereavement, this is, will be so hard for them but to be active, to be um, like doing something useful even for their community. Because children um, look to their mothers as a model for them. Sometimes you didn't need to tell your child do this and do that, just when they look at you and they look what are you doing? They start to do the same thing. So I think this is one of the things that give up power to women. Thank you. Helen? I wonder if you could say, sorry, I wonder if you could say something about um, you, your meetings are in Israel, your meetings are in the West Bank. Um, most of us don't understand the difficulty of movement between the two areas for Israelis and, and Palestinians. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and what you have to go through to get to each other's territory. I, I, you know, sometimes it's more important for an Israeli to tell the truth. Okay? So I think we stated right in the beginning that freedom of movement is a basic human right. Now, can you imagine if you wanted to go to Halifax? I don't know how many people ever want to go to Halifax, but maybe if they did, but maybe if you did, that you would have to go and get a permit. You know, so, um, from the army. So for Palestinians to come into Israeli schools, for instance, and to be vulnerable and to be in an environment where that's not very friendly, um, they have to get a permit through the army, which of course our office facilitates. Um, I don't know what's going to happen. For instance, we have a summer camp, which is starting in July, and it was going to be in a kind of a boarding school um, where children, um, I don't know how to say this politically correctly. I've lost all the politically correct things. Children who are problematic, I'm sure you that's not the right thing to say. But whatever it is, we'll be on holiday so we could use the facilities of the sporting school for 50 bereaved Palestinian and Israeli children to come to a summer camp. And now the mothers of the children who are in the boarding school are objecting to have us there and are trying to close the camp down through the Ministry of Education. So all of this we might have to go again. So work is very difficult, you know, and this movement between Palestine, I mean, I go to a lot of places in the West Bank where I'm not supposed to go. I could care less. Um, but there are restrictions. But it's really difficult for the Palestinians. Look, Lila, um, flew through Ben Gurion Airport together with me. We had to get special permission, and she has to get something. Tasrich, what would that be? A permit. It's a kind of a permit. Special. Every two minutes, when we were in the in the airport, of course they separate us and ask us individually questions to see if we, you know, this granny terrorist and Lara. <laughs> I'm going to blow up the airport. Um, but it's humiliating. Uh, it's not that the American um, customs or security are any more friendly, um, but it's humiliating. 
and to wait, I, I always wait for Lila because I have to come in another entrance. And sometimes I can stand there for an hour waiting for her to come and worry about what's happening, you know, why haven't they let her out yet? This is life for Palestinians, people who don't understand for a minute what the daily life is of a Palestinian and how important it is to end the conflict. I told you, the occupation is killing the moral fiber of Israel. You cannot occupy another place for so many years and not expect to import it into your society. We have more domestic violence than we've ever had, have more violence in the schools than in the streets. You bring it back with you. You can't send a 17 or 18 year old kid to stand at a checkpoint, give him a gun, in many cases, no idea where he is, by the way. They don't know where the West Bank is and expect that this will not be a traumatic experience and that he may come back and import that violence back into his society. And when you take away hope from a Palestinian kid, when you've got no future, what do you care? You might as well go and stab somebody and feel good about yourself. But they don't understand the consequences and many young people think that they are invincible, that nothing can happen to them. So those are stories that one must tell, but one must be part of the solution. You know, it's not at the expense of destroying Israel. Neither side is going to disappear. One has to have hope. Hope is that equation in, in peacemaking, which is the most important equation, because without that, there'll never be peace. And Palestinians can't go to schools to speak to children. So sometimes we invite them in hotels or other places or go to their houses. Uh, but it's really so important for us to go to the Israeli schools because for them, maybe they will never meet a Palestinian or even heard this story. And even it's a chance for us to understand a few things like I remember once when they asked me to go to one of schools to and the word. So I said to myself, just go there, speak about the story and the organization and just leave. But when I arrived, I looked at them, they are at the same age of my oldest daughter. So I said, just talk to them from that side. So after we spoke about the organization, about our story, they start to have many, many questions. And one of them, she asked me, and she said, uh, so you didn't want us to go to the army? And I said, oh my God, how could I answer that question? <laughs> then I said to her, look, I have a girl at the same age of you, and I love her much more than anyone in this world. But at the same time, I can't control her life. I could give her advices, and this is what I will do with you. And I could give you advice. So if you choose to be in the army, because I know this is your country, and if you didn't go to the army, you would be punished, uh, please be human. Look to the every human in front of you as you. Don't look to his color, don't look to his background, to his religion. Just imagine that you are on that side. And then she started to cry. And they follow us after we finish, they want to ask, other questions. So when I returned back home, I started to think about them, and I felt they should be in somewhere else, not to be in the army. Like at that age, they should be in a university or traveling or doing something else. I feel really sorry when I saw them in a checkpoint. Some of them, their guns taller than them, and I felt they are the victims. They are victims of their country, of their law. How you could send a child at that age in a crazy situation and give him a gun? I could understand how much he will be afraid of what started going on inside his mind to protect himself. It's not like I justify what they were doing, but it's kind of understanding the people who are behind that one. And imagine what kind of things you could make think about. Thank you, both of you. Certainly Lily's office knows the difference between getting 
a visa for an Israeli and a visa for a Palestinian to come to this event at General Assembly. Uh, in fact, we had feelers out all over the place, Lily, even talking to Rob Oliphant in Ottawa, who's the special secretary or whatever his title is to uh, Jali, Minister Jali, to try to figure out how to make this happen. And it did happen. And we are tremendously blessed and grateful that it did. It's very, very difficult for Palestinians to get visas to America, to Canada. It's actually harder to Canada. But um, they've started also to revoke visas. Uh, the American government has revoked uh, an Israeli who is part of our group. And there's this beautiful book called A Perigon. Yeah. I don't know if you know that. Yeah, we can. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So they just revoked Rami's visa oh. to America. And of course, by some, I mean, it's always a battle to get him a visa. So here's the freedom of movement. It's not only Israel. And, you know, there's often this talk about apartheid, right? So we were in the Deep South in, um, in America. We went on a trip to look at the civil rights movement and slavery, like New Orleans, Selma, Jackson, Montgomery. And I think there's apartheid in Selma and in Montgomery. And it was quite an eye-opener. I was with um, 12 evangelical priests. Me and 12 evangelical priests. <laughs> no, they drank a lot of cocktails, so we had fun. <laughs> so, you know, it's like, often there's so much criticism, but they don't look at their own country. Anything yet from online? Not online. My goodness, they're quiet out right there. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, quite a few years ago, I spent a, a month in, uh, in Israel studying at the Jerusalem University College, and we traveled all over the country, right up to the northern border down into the Negev. Um, on the last day before I was to get, to get on the plane and come home, I went to the tourist uh, part of Jerusalem and was doing some shopping. At one point, uh, it became very obvious to me that police were moving in and we were all cordoned off. You couldn't leave the sidewalk. And so, and then we saw trucks with wires. And eventually, uh, they detonated a package. The army came and detonated a package that had been abandoned. So, my own personal experience of that uh, shock of that experience, when I think about the ongoing fear that both Israelis and Palestinians live with, uh, how does that impact? I mean, we, we want to be people of hope, but to live in that kind of environment must be hugely challenging. Yeah. It's really so hard. I can't see it's easily. Because you face a lot of trouble every day, every day. Uh, I will tell you a short story. I worked in Jerusalem in 2015, and during that time there is um, what we call the uprising with knife, like they start to stab anyone in the street. So I walked to my office, and it was so cold, I wore gloves, it was gray, and an Israeli uh, man who crossed the road, and he started to look to my hands, and he thought that maybe I hold the knife because I want to stab him. And I started to be terrified because if he starts to scream, the police will come and shoot me even before they ask me. So that was crazy. Like, all of us terrified from each other, but no one want to attack the other. So this is so crazy. Like, when you think about that. But we take that hope from what happened to us. Like, even when I look to the eyes of my children every day, I want them to live in a better life. I want them to have a better education because they deserve that. God created us in this world to love and to live, not to kill each other without no mercy. So because of that, we can't stop, even in this hard times, even during the war, 
it's sometimes so hard to convince your children or the people around you about that, but we can't lose hope because we didn't want one day when they start to ask what they did to improve our life or to end this occupation. We didn't want them to say, they just sat beside and didn't do nothing. We do our best to change this. I know peace will never be tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, I wish that, but someday it will end. We didn't know when, but we can sit and say, no, let all leaders do something, because we are waiting for them from 75 years, and they make our life much more miserable. And when they have also agreement, it was failed because no one was ready to accept that. Like just one day, we woke up and they started to talk about peace. But just like yesterday, we killed each other, how now you start to talk about peace. And this is what we are doing in the burn circle. We start to make this reconciliation to let the people understand. It's not like that we agree about everything. Sometimes we argue about few things, but it's about respect, about trust, about understanding. This is the real reconciliation. It's not a piece of paper that I will sign up. But you know, when you live in an environment from wall to wall, right, it's, that's what it's like. All of a sudden, one morning you wake up and there's rockets and you know, outside my house and, and um, children are dying. And I think about the Palestinian women in Gaza who have no shelter. And I think about the women who live in the villages um, next to Gaza, Steort, Ashkelon, Ashdod. And I hear this woman speaking on the radio saying, I have three children and I have 15 seconds to get to the shelter and one is in a wheelchair. Who shall I take? So it's women that are eating the results of, of this madness. And nothing happens. You know, I went to the Security Council. I think with this we will end this. Um, and they were like uh, all the Security Council men sitting around the table at the UN. So one of the lucky things is I never prepare anything. It's just, you know, no, it's the best way because if you talk from your heart, I don't need to write a speech. So I was listening to them and they were talking about Shereen, the journalist that was killed. Okay, every, each and every one of them spoke about Shereen. Now we went to see the family and I felt sorry for them and, and the brother wanted to join the parent circle and they're a lovely family. But I asked them, look, 68 children were killed in Gaza in the last war. Do you know the name of one of those children? This is the thing, what do you have to be a celebrity to die and somebody will take notice? 68 children. Who cares? Who's going to remember those children? Of course, I was very popular after that, as you can imagine. <laughs> but it's something to ask yourself. You know, it's something to live. Um, that fear that you're talking about is what creates hatred. And that hatred creates violence. And something has to be done about the DNA fear of the Israelis, of Jews. There is a DNA, an inherent DNA survival um, mechanism for Jews. Not without good cause, I might say, but if you think about that, it's not an excuse for any behavior. But you might look at why there is this desperate survival behavior, you know, this fear, always fear. And of course, anti-Semitism rising its ugly head all over the world again. I'll ask you a question. Each of you is going to give me the answer. How many Jews are there in the world? How many? Just ballpark. Yes. You know the answer I'm not giving you. <laughs> no, maybe you don't. I don't know.
you understand how dangerous this is? Not <laughs> any.
words um, are limited, O oh God, as we uh, allow our hearts to feel all that we have heard and all that uh, aches and the agony and yet also the, the, the courage and the hope and, uh, and we live with that vision uh, for tomorrow, today. Uh, we thank you for witnesses uh, brave enough like Lila and, uh, and um, um, oh, Debrabi wow. and, and we pray, O oh God, that you protect them and guide them and be with them as they travel, as they go back to their homes, as they go back to, uh, to do the work, the important work they do. And be with us, as already said, um, as we ponder our relations, uh, the ways that we may be awakened, uh, maybe um, to, to be part of peace wherever we are. And we pray this way in Jesus' name. Amen.